All right, we're back together again. So let's uh, begin with a little prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, once again, we uh, gather together in your presence to uh, hear your word, uh, to deepen our understanding of, uh, of the working of your grace in our lives, uh, and our understanding of your, uh, your written word in the scriptures. So we ask you to uh, enlighten our minds and to warm our hearts, that uh, our time together here may bear fruit in our own hearts and souls, uh, and for the good of your church, our families, and friends. As we pray through Christ our Lord, our Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So wanted to just uh, kind of recap a little bit from where we finished last week, or we're finishing last week. So there in chapter 8, as the the seven trumpets are, are being blown, right? Just like the first four seals, so the first four trumpets are kind of more um, natural disasters, so to speak, that are warnings or chastisements for repentance. And the first four seals usually were like a quarter of this, that, and the other. Now the first four trumpets are a third, so it's like the, uh, the ante keeps getting raised. So even like at the end of this, uh, passage here in verse 12. It says, uh, the fourth angel blew his trumpet, a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, so that a third of them was darkened, and then a third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. So it's kind of, um, it's, not, it's not like, you know, the, the sun is darkened, so there's just a third of light. <laughs> it's a third of the day. So, in some ways, it's maybe there's a natural background to this, but there's also a, a, a spiritual message being communicated here about darkness and evil, and uh, you know the influence of evil in our in our world, in our lives, in our hearts. Right. So we're all, we all kind of be a mixture of light and dark, and are we letting the light grow and conquer over the darkness, or is is our obstinacy letting the darkness continue to grow, right? The, the more we turn away from, from God's guidance, from God's light, the darker our world, our lives, our hearts become. Um, and then in chapter 8, verse 13, there was this passage about the eagle. And I saw and I heard an eagle flying in mid-heaven, crying out with a great voice, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets which the three angels are about to blow. Right. So the eagle in the Old Testament was often a harbinger of bad news. So for example, in uh, the book of Isaiah, For thus says the Lord, Behold, one shall fly swiftly like an eagle, and spread his wings against Moab. The cities shall be taken, the stronghold seized, the heart of the warriors of Moab shall be in that day like the heart of a woman in her birth pains. Moab shall be destroyed and be no longer a people because he magnified himself against the Lord. Versus the Blessed Mother who magnified the Lord through herself. You know. But the eagle here is the harbinger of bringing destruction against Moab and, and Isaiah. And then also in Ho Hosea, set the trumpet to your lips. One like an eagle is over the house of the Lord because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. So the trumpet blows, the eagle is coming. That means disaster is on its way. So that's what this angel is you know, three woes for the three trumpets yet to come, all right? So the first four trumpets were more natural disasters, chastisements, calling us to repentance, calling us to uh, a greater zeal for, for God's word. The last three, the next three trumpets are kind of on a different order. The, uh, one of the commentaries said, this is where uh, the... Uh, the, the night, the, this is the stuff that nightmares are made of. <laughs> the, 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 the 
plagues, so to speak. All right. The fifth angel blew his trumpet. I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth, the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. And he opened the shaft, and smoke rose like the smoke of a great furnace. The sun and the air were darkened, um, and from the smoke came out locusts. And they were given power like the power of scorpions. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green growth or any tree, but only those of mankind who have not the seal of God upon their forehead. So those of mankind who are opposing God or <coughs> against the Lord. And notice it talks about the do not harm the grass of the earth. And earlier, in the earlier trumpet, uh, there was, you know, all, all, all the green grass was burned up. We were, some of us were talking about that uh, last week afterwards, and I think that's kind of a, a reminder to us that we can't take the either the seals or the trumpets in just kind of a, a logical sequence. That they're, they're chastisements, and, and in one sense you could say, you know, over the course of each human life, right, we experience certain disasters and ch chastisements, certain um, woes, uh, trials, struggles, etc. And so it's, it, it happens for each one of us because that call for each one of us is personal. The Lord is, is not just, you know, casting the dice out and whoever can respond. He's, he's a personal God who, who speaks to each and every person, right? So the, the grass may be burned up at one point and then it's hands off at the next point and a third of this person's world is darkened and not this other person's, etc. Alright? So I think we had gone through some of these. I just kind of wanted to, uh, to re-highlight some of those. So this is the plague of, of locust-like scorpions. Okay? And this star fallen from heaven to the earth is, we don't know for certain, but it seems like that was probably an image of Satan. And a little bit later on in chapter 12, uh, Satan will fall, or be thrown even more so, to the earth. So again, the, the time sequence, we have to be kind of careful there. It's, it's like a, the revelation is, is circling and circling and trying to get all of the information in there, all right? Jesus himself said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And again, I think in one sense you could say that happens every time a soul is saved. Every time there's a conversion, Satan falls. And uh, we want him to fall all the way <laughs> so that every single person is converted and saved and redeemed. Okay, and then I think we talked about the, the, the bottomless pit, right? In Luke chapter 8, they begged him, the demons, begged Jesus not to command them to depart into the abyss, this bottomless pit or abyss. And we went through some examples of maybe what the kind of a historical background to that would be the foundation stone in Israeli or you know, Jewish back uh, history there. That the temple was built over this, this rock that underneath seems to have this, you know, the, 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 rock, the rock kind of caps a shaft or a cave or a pit. And the tradition is that the, uh, the sacrifices that are offered on top of that rock hold the evil down within it. That that's also where the, uh, the flood with Noah's times, welled up from this abyss to, to cover the earth, and so it was capped. And the, and the prayers and the sacrifices are what hold the evil back. So that was the, uh, the temple there and kind of that reddish color and this purplish color is the Dome of the Rock, which is there now. Right? And right in the middle of, underneath the Holy of Holies, and in the middle of the Dome of the Rock, the rock being this foundation stone. All right. So the Dome of the Rock, and the actual mosque where the Muslims pray is over here. So 
but this is where the temple would have been. And there's the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall. Kind of a more of a picture photo of that and a close up. And then inside, even underneath the rock, there's steps going down and you can see the underside of that rock as well. There's the top side of the rock with another side view of it. So you can see there's a wall going around it and you can see approximately how, how high it is up, up above at least. Okay? All good then? Mm -hmm. All right, so just kind of recapping a few things there. Um, let's see. So, I think, is this, who, is this where we stopped last time? Mm -hmm. We stopped with the pictures, right? Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> Chapter 9. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. All right. We went through that. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. We went through that. So, chapter six, or not chapter nine, verse six. And in those days, men will seek death and will not find it. And they will long to die, and death will fly from them. And in appearance, the locusts were like horses arrayed for battle. So this is where the, the, this terrifying appearance of locusts, right? These little insects, um, or big insects, I guess you would call it, but, uh, you know, described in even larger and terrifying terms here. Locusts were like horses arrayed for battle, and on their heads were what looked like crowns of gold, and their faces were like human faces, and their hair like women's hair, and their teeth like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like iron breastplates. And the noise of their wings was as the noise of chariots with many horses running into battle. And they have tails like scorpions and stings in their tails. And in their tails they held power for hurting men for five months. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon. And in Greek, he is called Apollyon. The first woe has departed. Behold, two woes are still to come. All right. In the prophet Joel, the Old Testament, there was a similar description of a plague of locusts. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, like war horses they run. As with the rumbling of chariots, they leap across mountains like the crackling of a flame of fire devouring the stubble like a powerful army drawn up for battle. Before them, peoples are in anguish, all faces grow pale. So even in the Old Testament, the plague of locusts was described as an army coming to destroy. So this description of these, these locusts, it's, very, it's uh, pretty symbolic here, right? Crowns of gold. So a crown is an indication of a claim to rule. So they're coming to try to establish, you know, an alternate kingdom, so to speak. A kingdom of, of suffering, of domination. Human faces and women's hair. It's a parody of real humanity. This isn't, um, these, I mean, these are really uh, symbols of demons, right? They're coming up, it's this army coming up from, from the abyss, from this bottomless from, from Hades, really. So they're, they're, they're demonic characters here who are trying to <laughs> parody humanity but, but deform humanity. To say this is real humanity, not, not as God created humanity in his image and likeness. This is humanity in our image and likeness. Lion's teeth, their ferocity, they can, they can rip and tear. Iron breastplates, they can, they're impenetrable, invincible. The noise of chariots with many horses. If you, I, I have not been, but I can, I can kind of imagine being in 
arrayed in battle, right? And chariots with a bunch of horses, that would be a loud, terrifying sound. And they're charging down upon you, intimidating, right? So everything here is described to, to, to convey domination, uh, intimidation, uh, war, uh, struggle, suffering, perversion. Right? Jesus says in the Gospel of John, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So the Hebrew, the, 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 the king of these locusts, the, his Hebrew name is Abaddon, which in Hebrew means destroyer. And the Greek, Apollyon, is the same thing, one who destroys. So Jesus is contrasting the demonic horde against the Son of Man, the Son of God. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. All right? All right? So there's uh, an artist's depiction of the trumpet being blown, and there's the bottomless pit. You can see the uh, the altar in the back there with the the horns coming up on the on the the four corners. So there's a depiction of the actual <laughs> of the locusts, horses. I got the lions. Uh, fangs there, a weird sort of crown in this artist's depiction, with kind of antenna crowns. <laughs> but there's the iron breastplate, the long hair, the human face, the scorpion tail coming out the back. It's kind of hard to really depict it, but the, 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 the accumulation of symbols there is, is kind of powerful to convey. All right. The sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel. So this voice from the four horns. You know, earlier there was the uh, the an angel took incense on the uh, on the on the golden altar, and it was the prayers of the the holy ones rising to God. And then the angel takes some of the coals and throws them down to the earth. So perhaps it's that angel who is the voice crying out um, after the sixth trumpet is blown here, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So they're called angels, but they're most likely probably fallen angels because they were bound up. They only, only would have been bound up if they had committed some crime, right? So now they're about to be released to further destruction of God's enemies. And the four angels were released who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year to kill a third of mankind. It sounds mean, <laughs> right? Just a little. But two things. One is always remember that uh, earthly death is means nothing to God, right? Because it's 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 a doorway. It's it's sad or unfortunate for us in terms of the the, the separation and, and losing a loved one, at least temporarily from our understanding, temporary separation. It's tragic if that death uh, occurs with someone obstinate in their sins. And that's kind of the other side of this is they're going after the third of mankind who have refused to convert, who have refused to surrender to the Lord, and who are uh, persecuting those who are faithful to the Lord. And perhaps even drawing them away from the Lord because of their fear and intimidation. 
Verse 16. And the number of the troops of Calvary was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. That would be 200 million. <laughs> 200 million warriors here. I heard their number. And in this way, I saw the horses in the vision. And the ones sitting on them had breastplates of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur. And the heads of the horses were like lion's heads. And fire and smoke and sulfur issued from their mouths. By these three plagues, fire, smoke, sulfur, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur issuing from their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents having heads and by means of them, they wound. I don't want to ever have a nightmare about these things, right? <laughs> but they're, they are terrifying. In the book of wisdom, for your all-powerful hand did not lack the means to send upon them a multitude of bears or bold lions or newly created unknown beasts full of rage or such as breathe out fiery breath or belch forth a thick pall of smoke, or flash terrible sparks from their eyes. So John is drawing from all kinds of imagery from the Old Testament to convey this chastisement, this spiritual chastisement, you know, physical and spiritual. So there's a depiction of the, uh, the golden altar with the four horns. And in the Old Testament, when animal sacrifices were taken, taking place, uh, from time to time, a sacrifice would be offered to purify the altar. And so blood would be sprinkled or smeared on the four horns of the altar. But in the middle, in the altar itself, would have been the, the burning coals on which they would burn incense as an offering, a sweet-smelling offering to the Lord. And there's an example or an artist's depiction of that sixth trumpet plague. So you got the horses with lion's heads. They're breathing forth uh, fire and sulfur and smoke. And they have serpents for tails and pretty nasty uh, soldiers riding them. Right. Not, not good neighbors. Two hundred million is what the, the the number that John himself heard then. All right. And the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot either see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders or their drugs or their immorality or their thefts. So you can, it's kind of almost a lament that John has here. These, these chastisements come and they're not, they're not achieving the purpose their, their purpose here of effecting conversion. You know, they did not repent. And the description of, 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 of what follows there, I mean, the ones who were, were killed and many more, this is what they were doing. You can see how kind of horrible it is. Worshiping demons, idols, you know, murders, drugs, immorality, thefts. And, I mean, we can kind of, not to get real deep into it here, but I mean, there are disasters that happen all the time in our world, right? Natural disasters, man-made disasters, all, all of that. And is it, is it causing more faith? <laughs> Do people go through a struggle and, 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 and that strengthens their faith? We often seem to be concerned that when someone goes through a struggle, it's gonna weaken their faith. 
And so it's the opposite of what John seems to be, or what seems to be John is describing here in Revelation, that these chastisements are, 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 are warnings. But in our world, sometimes that does happen, right? We go through suffering and it makes us, it strengthens our faith. That's, that's what John is trying to depict here. 2 Thessalonians in the New Testament, Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. So... <laughs> An army of demons would certainly be the lawless ones, led by the lawless one, Abaddon, Apollyon, the destroyer. Right? Um, let's see here. So when, when it says, like, the power of the horses is in their mouths, you know, because Fire is supposed to be purifying, but it can also be destroying. Uh, smoke, I mean, should be like the, the smoke of incense going up, right? Prayers. But in this case, it's the smoke of destruction. And sulfur is often in, in the Old Testament uh, as associated with uh, a fiery kind of judgment. Like uh, think of Sodom and Gomorrah, where the sulfur and brimstone rain down upon them. All right? And and in their tails, the tails like serpents, right? And immediately that evokes the, the imagery of, of Genesis and, and the, the deceiving and destroying serpent. Which then connects even more so the fact that the people who are being destroyed are the ones who are worshiping demons, which is kind of interesting, right? Because uh, the devil turns against those who, who worship him. He doesn't have any love for people he just wants to destroy. Sue. All of this is, is pretty depressing. And, uh, you know, the more someone loves someone, the more sorrow there is connected with it when things don't go well. When God has uh, an infinite amount of love, and even so, when someone sins, their attention to them like going after that lost sheep to bring them back. So when they don't come back and he has infinite love, wouldn't he always have infinite sorrow for all of them? I would certainly, yeah, I, I think, I mean, you think of, of Jesus weeping over Jerusalem, right? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how, how often I long to, to gather you as a, as a hen gathers her, her chicks, but, but you, you refused. So how can we be happy in heaven when our fountain of life is going to be sorrowful? Our fountain of life is going to be sorrowful? Yes, it is our fountain of life. Is going to be sorrowful? Well, there's, there's two things. One is that this fountain of life is also the, uh, the just judge. You know who who if he uh, effects justice. So, in the long run, what's going on here is justice. Uh, in, in the end, the final, when the final judgment finally comes in Revelation and in, at the end of time, it will not. I mean, the uh, the evil one is the one who's Abaddon, who's the destroyer. God is redeemer. So anyone who is willing you know, to the least degree to be redeemed, he's going to redeem and then effect justice for them, you know. Now, the, the difficult thing is, uh, if, if someone truly is completely corrupted, there's, there's nothing to be redeemed there anymore. Uh, I mean, yeah, there's sadness in that, but, but justice says, they, they have chosen the destruction that, that, that they experience is what they have chosen. 
They want that. Sadness is, is something that can be beautiful at the same time. I think sadness, yeah, I mean, it brings, it brings wisdom. It brings a, a, a richer experience of emotions in life. Chapter 10, and I saw another mighty angel going down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud, and the rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire, and he had in his hand a little opened scroll, and he set his right foot on the sea, but his left foot on the land. And he called out with a great voice like a lion roaring. And when he called out, the seven thunders spoke out their voices. And when the seven thunders had spoken, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up what the seven thunders have spoken, and, and do not write it down. And the angel whom I saw standing on sea and land lifted up his right hand to heaven, and swore by the one who lives into the ages of ages, who created heaven and what is in it, the land and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there should be no more time. But in the days of the sound of the seventh angel, when he is about to blow the trumpet, the mystery of God, as he announced to his servants the prophets, should be fulfilled. All right. A lot of things going on in these seven verses here. So let's look at a little bit of Old Testament background here in Psalm 29. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders the Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. Right? So, like a lion roaring on the sea and on the land. Um, in 2 Corinthians, And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. So John heard some things which he's told not to write down. I think what is the, the commentators usually say about that is that it was, it's a, uh, like here's seven more judgments or seven more chastisements, but there was an act of mercy on God's part. And he rescinded the seven chastisements in front of the, the seven thunders. Okay. And then in Genesis, when the Lord smelled the pleasing odor, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again destroy every living creature as I have done. So again, God's mercy. He, he withholds this kind of ju uh, judgment or chastisement in, in the future. All right, so let's, um, well, here's a, an image of this mighty angel with one, his feet like fire, one foot on the sea, one on the land. He's got the rainbow, he's swearing an oath. He's got the little scroll in his hand, all right? Roaring like a lion. All right, so let's go into this a little bit more here. Some commentators say this mighty angel is Jesus. And there's a lot to commend that, right? Uh, he's got the, the rainbow over his head, just as the, the throne back in chapter 4 
uh, of God was surrounded by the, the, the rainbow, right? His face was like the sun. In the Gospels, in the Transfiguration account, Jesus' face shines like the sun. So it's a resurrection. His legs like pillars of fire, right? Um, flaming fire. He's uh, like the Holy Spirit. Um, and the little, this is one of the biggest uh, examples of this, or evidences for this perhaps being Jesus is this little opened scroll. That's the, 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 the scroll that the seven, with the seven seals earlier that the lamb had opened one by one, right? And after it's opened, it still has to be read. <laughs> while, he's, while he's opening them, he's not like, as, as he opens the, each seal, it's not like, oh, a, por a portion of the scroll is being read. You have to open all seven seals before you can unroll it and read what's inside. And so now that it has been opened, now this mighty angel holding the scroll comes to give it to John, the prophet, to, to proclaim. And then also, uh, he calls out with a great voice, like a lion roaring. That's the, the lion who's like a lamb, this is an angel roaring like a lion. That's an, uh, often, anyway, an image of the Davidic king and Jesus being the Davidic king. All right. Now, it's, it's not completely 100% certain that this refers to Jesus because it's, he's called an angel, a mighty angel. And, and, and the angel whom I saw, you know, and he swears by the one who lives into the ages of ages. And that could, Jesus could certainly have done that. There's nothing contradictory there. And Jesus himself could be also referred to as an angel. The word angel simply means a messenger. Jesus is God's great messenger. So it is very possible that this refers to Jesus. It's just a little bit strange that it's not a little more earlier. It's, it was a little clearer. When, it, when Jesus was being depicted. All right? So, with the seventh trumpet, the mystery of God, as he announced to his servants the prophets, should be fulfilled. All right? Verse 8. And the voice which I had heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, so that's probably the, the angel from the, the four horns of the, uh, of the altar. Right? The voice which I had heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go take the open scroll, which is in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. Now, al alternatively, it could also be the voice that had called John up into heaven, the voice of Jesus. So... It's not completely clear again, but the, the, the voice, the most, most recent voice was the voice coming from the uh, golden altar. Verse 9. And I went to the angel, saying to him to give me the little scroll. <laughs> Going up to this mighty angel, <laughs> give me that little scroll. And he said to me, take it and eat. And it will be bitter to your stomach, but sweet as honey in your mouth. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. And it was in my mouth like sweet honey. And when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And they said to me, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. All right. So, of course, part of the background here comes from Ezekiel, where Ezekiel was told, and he said to me, Son of man, eat whatever you find here, eat this scroll, and go speak to the house of Israel. Right. So, another thing 
Well, a couple of things here. One other thing that argument that could be made that this is Jesus, or I'm sorry, that this is not Jesus, this this mighty angel, is that you know just as there are uh, people that we see who this person seems so Christ-like, you know, it's like they're they're an altar Christus. People often refer to Saint Francis of Assisi as being the one of the most Christ-like people to live since Christ. Um, and so that could certainly be the case with a mighty angel. Some of the angels in heaven would be <laughs> very Christ-like, who are very close to the Lord. So it could be an angel who is just very, very close to Christ, very close to his power and authority, sharing in his power and authority. That's, that's one thing. And then this thing I hear about, so John takes this scroll and eats it. The idea is these are the prophetic words from the Lord that John is being told, you know, eat the scroll in the sense of this is what you have to preach. This has to come from within you. Digest this plan of God and then proclaim these words to the world. A prophetic word that comes from within. It comes from God, but it comes from within us. We receive what the Lord gives us and then we give it back. And the word of the Lord, there's multiple places in the Old Testament, you know, is, is sweet to the, to, the, to the taste, sweet to the mouth, right? I remember when I studied Hebrew in college, and you know, it took a while <laughs> learning just the Hebrew alphabet, and it was so different of a language. And the first day we learned our first vocabulary word. We showed up in class, and the, the professor of Monk of the Conception had, had a Hershey's kiss on each one of our desks. Because the word of God is sweet to the taste. And we learned our first Hebrew word there. But it's sweet to the taste, but it's bitter in the stomach. Because what John is going to be prophesying is woe. <laughs> you know, prophesying about people's nations, tongues, and kings. He's going to be prophesying hard things. And so it's not something that he's going to want to do or enjoy doing even. Okay. And I was given a measuring rod like a staff. And I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. And do not measure the court outside the temple. Cast that out, for it is given over to the nations. And they will trample over the holy city for 42 months. All right. In Corinthians, St. Paul writes, According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and another man is building upon it. Let each man take care how he builds upon it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Do you not know that you are God's temple? and that God's Spirit dwells in you. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and that temple you are. All right? So John has just been given the scroll to digest and prophesy with, and now he's measuring the temple. In one sense, we could say his, his words of prophecy is prophesying, is taking the measure of every human temple out there. How well are we uh, dwelling places of the Holy Spirit? Or, you know, are we, have, we, have we given ourselves over to the nations to be trampled upon? Measuring of the temple is here is parallel to the ceiling of the 144,000. So that part of the temple is under God's protection. Right. So where God's spirit dwells will be safeguarded. Wherever the spirit is will be safeguarded. You know, my, my earthly body may be destroyed, but my soul, given over to the spirit, will be protected. The prophet Zechariah, 
I will be to Jerusalem a wall of fire round about, says the Lord, and I will be the glory within her. God will protect her from all harm. Jesus said, Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. There's a lot of conversions yet to have, to, to be made, right? A lot of coming into uh, the fold of God yet. And so until that happens, there's always going to be trampling of, of, of God's of God's temple, <laughs> or at least the, the outer court of God's temple. First Maccabees from the Old Testament. Now on the 15th day of Chislev, in the 145th year, they erected a desolating sacrilege upon the altar of burnt offering. Early in the morning, on the 25th day of the ninth month, month which is the month of Chislev, in the 148th year, they rose and offered sacrifice as the law directs on the new altar of burnt offering which they had built. So the, the first part there in chapter 1 relates the, uh, the, the pagans who desolated the altar. And then the second part, after the Jews had reclaimed the temple and they erected a new altar and started sacrifices upon it again. So this period of time from uh, the sacrilege to the new altar, you know, is, is a... It's like a, a, a period of time when, when the temple was being trampled upon. And then, and then there was a, a rebirth, so to speak. Okay? And I will grant my two witnesses power to prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands which stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours out from their mouth and consumes their foes. And if anyone would harm them, thus he is doomed to be killed. They have power to shut the sky, that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to smite the earth with every plague as often as they desire. All right. The two witnesses. So Elijah the Tishbite, he wore a garment of hair cloth with a girdle of leather about his loins, and he, sa he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. So one of the greatest witnesses or prophets in the Old Testament was Elijah. One of the two witnesses here or two, is, is clothed in sackcloth. That was a um, hair cloth, sackcloth. That was kind of a, a, a sign of Old Testament prophets. John, the, the last and the greatest of the prophets, uh, from the, you know, kind of that transition from Old Testament to New Testament, John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather girdle around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. So, two witnesses with power to prophesy. All right, they're summing up all of all of the prophets here. Um, well, there's one example here of, from the Old Testament. Um, that also talks about two olive trees and, and as two witnesses that give forth oil. Um, in Zechariah 4, the governor Zerubbabel and the high priest Joshua are shown as the Lord's anointed for the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem after the return from the Babylonian exile. So after they've come back from the Babylonian exile, these the governor and the high priest in Zechariah are depicted as two olive trees that are uh, enabling the rebuilding of the temple, the, re the rebuilding of the land after the Babylonian destruction and exile. So John seems to be drawing on Zechariah there to kind of sum up uh, the Old Testament prophesying as a rebuilding, as a, as a restoration. 
The chosen witnesses of Jesus are his anointed for building up the church to become the eschatological Jerusalem. All right. So John draws from imagery in the Old Testament in order to relay truths about the current time that, we're, that we are going through. So there's kind of an image of what John is, is seeing, these two witnesses that are, that are like two olive trees. Olive trees are, are sound, signs of symbols of great uh, growth and healing. The oil that comes from them is, is used for, for nourishment, for cooking, for healing, for you know, anointing, for religious services, for sports. For, for all kinds of things. And so they're, they're signs of, of, of strength and, and, and youth. Right? And they're standing before the heavenly temple. You see the earthly temple down below and the heavenly temple up above. Elijah answered the captain, in 2 Kings here, Elijah answered the captain of 50, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. And that's what happened, if you read through 2 Kings there. So in John, when he says, If anyone would harm them, fire pours out from their mouth and consumes their foes. So again, John is drawing from this Old Testament example of Elijah, the, the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, to relay that you know there's there's this um, fire or you know fiery preaching that comes forth from the mouth and consumes foes, hopefully converts hearts and, and lives and minds. Jeremiah, behold, I am making my words in your mouth a fire, and this people would, <laughs> and the fire shall devour them. All right, that's what prophecy is supposed to do supposed to uh, consume in the sense of purifying and converting. All right. They have power to shut the sky that no rain may fall. So that's also something that uh, Elijah did in, in the Old Testament. He prayed and for three years, so it was, there was, there was a drought and then he prayed and it, and it rained again. So those are, that's a prophetic power from the Old Testament that is being called upon here. Um, power over the waters to turn them into blood and to smite the earth with every plague. Who would that be? Moses, right? The two witnesses, Moses and Elijah. Those are the two ex kind of foreshadowings or prefigurements that John is using to describe New Testament witnesses. Christian witnesses, Christian prophets. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends from the bottomless pit, so it's not just any old beast, it's the beast, <laughs> that ascends from the bottomless pit will make war upon them, upon the two witnesses, and conquer them and kill them. So God's prophets can, in this world, can be overcome. And the dead body of them will lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. So the great city is what? Which city? Jerusalem, right? <coughs> So, but again, it's in some ways it's symbolic, right? Jerusalem was certainly um, the city where the where the Jesus was crucified, and if you read through the Old Testament, they call Jerusalem every name in the book. You know, later on when we get to the the, the great harlot, Jerusalem was certainly called by the prophets a great harlot, and and Sodom and 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 and, uh, and Egypt. Jerusalem was oftentimes had 
alliances and affiliations with Egypt. And they, they wanted to go back there, even with, with, the, with the Babylonian exile. They wanted to, to flee to Egypt for safety, which didn't help them. All right? So it's, it's, the great city is Jerusalem, but it's symbolic of every city which is turns against God, persecutes God's anointed. Verse 9. And for three days and a half, that's half of seven, <laughs> men from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations gaze at the dead body of them and refuse to let their dead bodies be placed in a tomb. So the apogee of disrespect, right? We don't care about them. We don't care about their bodies. We have no respect for them. And those who dwell on the earth Always a negative term, or a phrase in, in John, in Revelation. Those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and send gifts to one another. Because these two prophets have been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. And after three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them. And they stood up on their feet. So, I'm not completely certain here, but is it for three and a half days there was ridicule, and then three and a half days later, so seven days, kind of seems to imply that, it's not completely certain, but it could be then total seven days, a breath of life from God entered them, resurrection, right? And they stood up on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. It's like, you, for someone who doesn't believe in resurrection, who's an enemy of God, to be confronted with the resurrection is, would be terrifying, right? That no matter how much we conquer you, you win. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying to them, Come up hither, which is exactly what John had heard, right? And in the sight of their foes, they went up to heaven in a cloud, just like Jesus did. Book of Daniel. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, as for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, and it shall speak words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change the times and the law, and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times and half a time, like the three and a half days. Time, times, half a time. All right? There's, in the Old Testament, in Daniel, and here in Revelation, there's this, there's a seeming victory by the enemies of God, but it's not true victory. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says, Amen, amen, I say to you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. Same, same thing. John is drawing on Old Testament imagery and gospel truth, gospel uh, words of Jesus. Ezekiel, so I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet, an exceedingly great host, the Valley of Dry Bones, the vision of the, of the Valley of Dry Bones, and uh, resuscitation there. Psalm 105, Egypt was glad when they departed, for dread of them had fallen upon Egypt. Great fear fell on those who saw them. When they see God is on their side. Now, the logical thing would be if I see the power of God, and it's greater than my power, to surrender to that power of God. But fear is not a surrender, in this context at least. Fear is, you know, I'm going to run away from you, rather than surrender into your grasp or power. As Jesus was conquered and then rose, so his faithful witnesses are conquered and then rise. Okay? Just 
Just a couple more things and we'll wrap up again. And at that hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell and the names of 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Ah, finally, <laughs> some hope here, some, some good news, all right? First of all, it's interesting, and the names of 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. It's a kind of a strange phrase there. On the one hand, maybe it just means it's a way of saying 7,000 people. But earthquakes, if you remember, we talked about this once before, are kind of uh, prophetic, symbolic, you know, of something bigger than just like a, a shaking of land. It's symbolic of, of, a, of a spiritual turning or regressing. And so when it says the names of 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, it's, a, it's almost like the names of these 7,000 were being shaken out of the book of life. Like they were, they were, not, they were not repentant. They were not um, with the Lord. And so their names were blotted out. But the rest of the city, in their fear of the Lord, terrified in that sense, they gave glory to the God of heaven. First Kings, yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So in First Kings, the 7,000 were the ones who remained faithful. And in Revelation, it's you know, there's only 7,000 that are faithful here. It's 7,000, uh, you know, are not faithful, and the rest give glory to God. Ezekiel, in my jealousy and in my blazing wrath, I declare on that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. All right. A great earthquake. God bringing judgment. God bringing decision. Uh, let's see, do I go? Um, we're going to, we'll just read through this and might say just a few things and then we'll stop, all right? Because this is chapter, the, the end of chapter 11 and then chapter 12 that gets into the woman cloaked with the sun and the great red dragon, and that's big stuff. So we'll read through this. The second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. And the seventh angel blew his trumpet. And there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign into the ages of the ages. Great voices in heaven, many voices proclaiming this. And the 24 elders who sit, so it's kind of interesting, the, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord. Uh, C.S. Lewis said, you know, those who, who make it into heaven will look back on their time on earth, and it's like, in, in a sense, it's like I was always in heaven. It's like the, 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 the Lord was, it was like the outskirts of heaven, and those who who don't make it to heaven will look back on their time on the earth and say, well, it was always hell. It was always hellish. So the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ for those who, who reign. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty. You know, so here's a, We've returned to the heavenly throne room here. We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who are and who was, doesn't say and who is to come, because <laughs> he's come. <laughs> who are and who was, that you have taken your great power and begun to reign. And the nations raged, and your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged and to give the reward to your servants, 
the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both the small and the great, and to destroy the destroyers of the earth, to destroy Abaddon and Apollyon. And God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. And there were flashes of lightning, and voices, and peals of thunder, and an earthquake, and great hail. Lots of earthquakes, right? If you count up throughout my, you know, each one of our lives, how many times we've had a spiritual earthquake. <laughs> Every time it's like, I didn't realize what I was doing there. I need to, I need to turn to convent, uh, repent, convert, all right? So the 24 elders who summarize Old and New Testament, you know, all of the, uh, the, the faithful leaders of God's people, He will, in Matthew, he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. The seventh angel blew his trumpet. And they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. First Thessalonians, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Psalm 2 you know, look up in the nation's rage. Why did the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? <laughs> the nations raged and your wrath came, which is justice. God's wrath is justice. The sin is its own reward, <laughs> has its own wages. Book of Numbers, whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. And let those who hate you flee before you. Um, those who fear your name flee before you. All right? All right. Comments or questions about what we've covered here this evening? Yeah. Where is the God of love? <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm not getting it, apparently. So, it depends on what we mean by love, right? Mm -hmm. is, is love to uh, let someone else, you know, here, here's, let's say I have a, a big family. Let's say I have ten kids here. <clears throat> and these people over here are attacking my kids, mm -hmm. doing harm to them. What do I do? I said, well, I love these people too. Well, yeah, I, I love them, but I need to protect my family, mm -hmm. and I need to, if I really love them, I need to call them to accountability. And so that's, that's part of love is justice. One aspect of love is justice, and we're, John is kind of showing us, maybe in, in, in a stronger sense right now, that because he's talking about the the final chastisements, or not final, but the chastisements, but, and leading to the final judgments, that are about, you know, how, how the, the, the souls of the martyrs under the altar. How long, O oh Lord, before you, you know, bring justice to our cause? We, we were cruelly tortured and martyred. Where is justice? If, if God is not a God of justice, then he's no God. He has to be able to bring uh, justice to all the um, evils that we suffer in this world, because just you know, in God's love, He wants to, as it's you know, some of the people have been marked like 144,000 to protect them, and then there's been uh, judgment on the rest, and that judgment on the rest is, um, at least in one sense, it's. It's, it's kind of like, you know, sending someone to prison, I would say not in the United States, <laughs> but in a prison that is truly um, not punishment, but reform. Trying to reform them. Trying to give them a, uh, a sense of repent of your ways. Lo love 
as justice in that regard. I've been kind of like thinking about this in the sense of like all of mankind are seeds in a garden and they can choose to be wicked seeds that turn into weeds or productive fruit and all the way up to this and he's given them all this time to grow and then they made their decision to be weeds so we're going to clear the garden now for the productive fruit to grow and so what do you do you just pass the seven or, or round up everything and then what good can survive yeah in, in the gospel jesus uses almost that exam that that ex, uh, exact example when he talks about you know that at the end of time the son of man will send out his angels to gather the the, the harvest of the earth and the, the wheat will be gathered into his barn and the weeds will be tied into bundles and used as fuel so in a sense jesus is saying even the even the wicked wickedness <laughs> will have a purpose in the end you know uh, jr tolkien in in one of his writings he says he has god say to kind of the wicked angel you, you you're mighty <laughs> mighty are you after that he's done all this damage to creation he says you are mighty but you need to realize that there's nothing that you can do that will not find its ultimate end in me that you think that you're rebelling against me but i'm going to redeem it and bring about a greater good from it and that because he leaves us free, that doesn't mean that Satan himself is going to be redeemed, but everything that Satan does can and will be redeemed. So that's, when we talk about the God of love, I mean, that's, there has to be freedom. And then justice. It's kind of a hard to pull it all together and we, because we want everybody to be converted and saved and that's frustrating when they're not when they refuse you know as you get to the end of the book um, there shall not be anything accursed anymore but it says all we'll see is the throne of God and the Lamb you know that just beautiful image and then the, word, the last word of the book is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ it ends with a benediction which is beautiful in light of everything Right. Yeah, and, and what, yeah. So the, the, at the end, it, it, it's the Book of Revelation. For those who are, are online and maybe couldn't hear you, Bill, are uh, the, the the vision is filled with this um, the the Lamb and the One on the throne and the River of Life and uh, the the benediction of the grace of the Lord be with you, uh, with you all. Now earlier. You know, prior to that, there's the, the, the second death, the final judgment for those who just refuse to, to repent and convert. And hopefully, you know, we can, Hans Urs von Balthasar said, uh, we can hope that, the, that that number is very few, like the demons, Satan and his demons. Um, but it's certainly possible that there are human beings who have, who have, taken on that rebellion to such an extent that they are beyond redemption. All right? Well, let's close with the glory be. And the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you.